to come up. The most fun I've had all week is banging on this piece of wood. You can tell how good the week is going. I'm going to open the meeting officially. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'll be acting as the MC, and I'm going to invite everyone to move a little closer using the excuse, which is factual, that I'm actually extremely nearsighted. <laughs> We're going to get started with this um, NRI to NRI collaborative session. I will be seated here for just a few minutes, and then we're going to start with the questions and discussion from our panelists, and I'll be moderating from down here. So I will be here for setting the stage, and then I will be moderating from here so I can see the audience and the panelists all. So let me just open this by talking very briefly about why there are NRI to NRI collaborative sessions. The NRIs have become a network, sharing information and sharing best practices and ideas in just the last two years, although they've existed since 2006. We've had significant growth in the NRIs in the last two years. In November of 2015, we had roughly 57 NRIs. We now have, counting the 10 that are in formation, in formation, we now have over 100. So that means we have a lot of new NRIs. And there was great interest on the part of the NRIs themselves to have a way to share information with each other, 
face-to-face -face exchange on the issues that are highest priority to them. We conducted a consultation among the NRIs to first of all select the topics that would be discussed in the NRI to NRI sessions. And the, we then asked for NRIs to volunteer and pick their top priority and to organize the session. So I am going to uh, actually ask one of our co-organize, one of the co-organizers, others will be speaking, but I'm gonna ask one of the co-organizers, Omar, to share with us for two minutes Omar, here, here. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to ask Omar to share with us for two minutes the vision, and then I will turn to Mary Aduma to share the vision of why this group of NRIs felt that this topic was the highest priority to be addressed, and then we will go on with our session. But I'd like you to help us set the stage. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, my name is uh, Omar Mansour Ansari. I'm from the IGF Afghanistan. Uh, we had our first IGF Afghanistan in March uh, 2017. It was this year, three days event. Uh, 200 participants uh, from all uh, major stakeholders. Uh, there were a number of sessions uh, parallel, including uh, main sessions on uh, women in tech, uh, kids academy, um, cybersecurity, um, access, and other relevant issues uh, that were important for Afghanistan. It was a great experience, but uh, the reason uh, we have proposed a session, a collaborative session on uh, access was because access has been a major uh, challenge for Afghanistan. Uh, and one of the major issues uh, uh, for uh, um, access issues is the price of internet. It's extremely expensive in Afghanistan to get an internet, especially uh, fiber to home. Uh, there are other technologies like WiMAX, point to point, 3G, 4G, uh, but all of these are uh, extremely expensive. It's uh, $150 at average for um, one MB uh, of a connection. Uh, and if you get a hundred MB, that's going to be fifteen thousand to sixteen thousand uh, US dollars. So that's a, a major challenge. And number two is um, the content, um, uh, local local content and local uh, technologies in Afghanistan. People do not see the benefits uh, um, that that the internet provides because content is not in their language or it's not relevant to them. So um, that has been a major issue, and only 5% of the Afghan population approximately is connected to the Internet. We have a um, population of 30 million uh, people uh, in a country. majority of them are not connected. So they do not have, uh, due to lack of uh, connectivity and access, they are not, um, uh, you know, uh, like uh, benefited from the glories that the Internet and connectivity uh, will provide to them. And that includes education, healthcare, uh, e-business, and uh, so many other things. Thank you. And uh, perhaps, Mary, before I turn to you, I'm just going to make a, a brief comment myself. Um, Marilyn Cade as the MC. Today, in our world, we are facing the kind of revolution in technology and innovation that the world faced when they, we first introduced high-speed communications, point-to-point, -point, and high-speed computer processing. But we had so many fewer people to educate at that time because we had not yet moved to the truly distributed access to either communications or computing. Laptops didn't exist. It was a very centralized command and control approach, but we were moving into e-commerce and into what we saw in the future as an information age. We've really moved so far that today, and we are ready to leapfrog into an even further digitized world where 
not only these devices are going to get smarter and smarter and smaller and smaller, but our cars are going to talk back to us. And we are going to see the growth of the use of artificial intelligence, bots, et cetera, in many cases doing really, really good things, perhaps helping with monitoring plants, water, et cetera. But we're also going to see that if you are left behind in terms of access or in terms of digital literacy, you are going to really be the equivalent of on an island with no boat or airplane to get you out. So access is an incredibly important fundamental building block to being a living citizen today in our world. Yet four billion people today are not connected or are underconnected. And I'd like us to keep thinking about this as a, a conjoined phrase, because there are people who have no access at all, and they are unconnected. And there are people who are counted as being connected, but they are they have, they're only able to afford to connect once a day or once a week. They are significantly underconnected. Or if they are connected, they don't have a device that actually enables them to reach all of the applications that they need. And we're seeing new barriers grow up. So we had been focused on the idea that we must deal with building out and making affordable access. And now we're seeing that for other reasons, state actors and others are taking steps to deny access, even in what many of us thought were perhaps um, emerging economies or even developed countries. So internet shutdowns are a significant new growing threat to being connected and being always on. The other problem that I think we should acknowledge in access is that I was, um, I moderated the Afghan Open Forum yesterday, uh, a workshop on two networks that will uh, create your future. And we have decided that it's actually three networks that will create your future. That is the communications network, the electric, the, the power network, the electricity network, and the financial network. So as we think about the barriers, and we're going to talk about them, and then we're going to talk about solutions, I want us to keep thinking about the fact that we have to continue to educate people that it is not mere access we are talking about. We're talking about the kind of access and devices and digital literacy and applications and content that people can use to improve their health, to learn about how to improve the crops they raise, or their jobs that create jobs in countries. And that's why I'm so excited about this, this particular session. And Mary, I want to turn to you for comments from you as one of the co-organizers about your vision. Thank you, Marilyn. My name is Mary Uduma. I am from Nigeria, but I do coordinate the West Africa IGF. And this year, 2017, uh, we held the West African IGF in um, Benin. And one of the outstanding issues that we discussed was access. And we have a lot of barriers. Not only that we have barriers in terms of technology, infrastructure, but in terms of uh, policies policies from our government and our environment in particular, I want audience to know, environment in particular is moved by the government. government. Government is the highest spender, government takes the lead, government moves and shakes the, the environment. So for that reason, when government come up with shutdown of internet, it impinges on the fundamental right of the individual to have access to health care, to financial, to, to, to even the information from the government itself. So we felt that it was wrong and it, it, it will impeach on our development if we continue to shut down on internet because that's the way the world is going. That's the only thing that we could do 
to continue to exist. So our the essence of this is that government shut down internet for whose interest? Whose interest are they shutting down the in internet? Just for selfish interest? Yeah, you could say po political, but the ordinary person on the street that doesn't even have electricity, that does not know how to type on, the, on computers, they still lack access. So in discussing this, we also came up with the declaration that they, there should be no time that there will be blackout of the internet in our region. Having said that, we have the infrastructure issues, not only the ICT infrastructure, but the adjacent infrastructures. So those are the things, those are the, my motivation into this, uh, this session. And I know that the, the panelists they would do justice to it. And we want to share uh, experiences of what happened in other jurisdictions so that we can take it back home and see how we can implement that in our own jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Marilyn speaking again as the MC. So at the end, we're going to devote uh, 15 minutes to developing our core messages. What are the agreed within this room ideas that we have so that we have, we're able to deliver a concrete message about you, I think you were thinking about it as a unified declaration. That may be difficult to achieve in a short period of time, but we at least can come up with our ideas for recommendations for action. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to throw out the first question, and before I do that, I am going to uh, ask each of you to just introduce yourselves very, very briefly because we're going to do this relatively interactively. So I'm going to ask all the panelists to introduce themselves briefly. I will be referring to the speakers by the name of their NRI, but they will be using their name when speaking. So I would like to uh, ask our Sri Lanka uh, NRI to introduce himself. Hello, good morning. I'm Maheshwara Kiridigoda from Sri Lanka IGF. Uh, I'm Secretary to Internet Society Sri Lanka chapter, Secretary to the uh, Lanka network operators group and uh, various other organizations as well which related to internet and internet governance. Uh, I work in the private sector and uh, entrepreneur. Uh, Thank you. And now I will go to Georgia. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, my name is Ucha Seturi. Uh, I'm coordinating national IGF and also working for Small and Medium Enterprise Association and also part of Boko Chapter board member. Thank you. And now I will go to West Africa. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Saliu Mansere. Uh, here on behalf of uh, West Africa IGF. I'm from Sierra Leone. I'm an advisor to the government on, of Sierra Leone on ICT issues. Thank you. And to Afghanistan. Okay. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Marilyn. My name is Aziz Takwa, and I'm here from the IGF Afghanistan. And I work uh, as uh, the Director of Information Technology at the American University in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, my name is Julian Casas Buenas. I'm from the uh, Colombian IGF, and I will speak uh, on behalf of the Colombian IGF. Uh, I'm working in the civil society sector, and um, <coughs> access was one of the topics that we have been discussing for the last IGF. So Thank you. And? Thanks, Marilyn. My name is Kevon Swift. I am from Trinidad and Tobago, and I work for LACNIC, which is the Internet Registry for Latin America and the Caribbean. 
Lachnik is the Secretariat to the LAC IGF, and I'm here representing the Steering Committee of the LAC IGF, which is a multi-stakeholder advisory committee that guides its activities throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get started with the first question. Um, Your mic. I'm going to get started with the first question, and I'd like you to uh, try to keep your answers to um, around two minutes because we're going to try to do a number of rounds of questions, and we are going to um, we are going to come back on another round. If you see a microphone at your table that's lit, would you turn it off? Thank you. Um, first of all. Um, We've heard uh, comments about the importance of public policy. So let me ask each of you to say a few words, first of all, about why do you think we need to connect? Who is not connected in your country or in your region? Are there specific categories or sectors that are particularly affected by lack of access, uh, such as children or tribal groups or rural, people with disabilities. And then after you talk about that, would you talk about your perspective on the state of public policy that supports connectivity and access in your country? So it's kind of a two-part question. And I'd like to turn to Sri Lanka first, and then we'll just keep going. Hello, I'm Maheshwara from Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, Sri Lanka is a country, it's an island. So we have 20 million people uh, who is a uh, 6 million is connected. So there are about 15 million to be connected. So there are a lot of people to be connected. We have people in the rural areas, uh, such as the provinces which war affected areas, mm -hmm. and also some part of the uh, non war affected areas also not connected. And under connection is a another problem in our country. So what we have to do, we have to improve the access. We have to improve the access because all the services and all the facilities are now going turning into the internet era. So because of this, uh, some people who do not get the access or who are underconnected will not get these equal, equal preferences for these services and these facilities that they're going to have. So especially uh, thinking of the students in the rural area where teachers are not willing to go into the, these schools might have internet where that we can facilitate them and people who with disabilities especially we need to th think of it, them there are a lot of people in sri lanka with various kind of uh, disabilities we need to discuss as a separate problem in sri lanka and again uh, when it comes to the uh, access the services like health and agriculture now turning into uh, internet services especially uh, for the last uh, two years back, there was a policy to uh, sign a form, e-form, for the every farmers to get uh, their uh, fertilizers. So this was very terrible decision that government took, which is <laughs> actually these users, the, even though they have the access, they do not have the literacy to use these uh, electronic forms. So, uh, so if go government and other people uh, out of the country looking this kind of implementation, the access is a real problem in our country. So this identified by IGF Sri Lanka. It was the first topic that we have discussed in our first IGF as next billionth user, where there were participants from government and all other stakeholders, where they took this uh, initiative uh, as prosperous as this discussion went on uh, with uh, arguments and so on. Uh, regarding we have failed in our government, we had two uh, things uh, tried out. One is free internet, free hotspot around the country to cover cover the uh, Sri Lanka, which is at the moment working for 100 megabytes per month per user. But uh, then after another attempt was there to uh, create the first Google Loon uh, connected country, but it failed with because of this all the project came top to bottom. It approached from top to bottom. Mm. It's not approached from the bottom to top. So uh, it is needed 
the multi-stakeholder and bottom to top communication to uh, need uh, to create these kind of policies. So uh, IGF Sri Lanka uh, stand there to make it happen anyway, uh, even though there it is uh, challenging. Thank you. Thank you. And let me please. Um, okay, for us in uh, my name is uh, Saliu Mansere. For us in West Africa, the the challenges are there, more so because uh, we happen to be one of the most impoverished areas in the world, and uh, a major barrier is obviously infrastructure, and also there are political situations which presently are getting better because we are, um, at least um, got rid of almost all but one of the despots. Uh, but thankfully, the, the issue of shutdown has happened before, but uh, there are now moves to ensure that within the region it is made um, uh, illegal by the regional body ECOWAS. Um, but the major factor is literacy. Um, the technology that we have in terms of the use of the internet doesn't help in terms of a major disability, the disability of people to read. It's not just people who can see, but I think to read and be able to write is also a disability. And most technological uh, providers, the Facebooks, the Twitters, do not look at that disability. If they can look at that disability of people who cannot read and write, perhaps we can make technology work for those who do not have access. <clears throat> that's a very, Marilyn speaking, that's a very interesting um, uh, and unique uh, idea that I'm going to capture as one of the things we may want to talk about as a key message. May I please, Colombia. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. My name is Julian Casas Buenas, speaking on behalf of the Colombian IGF. Um, since the uh, first uh, meeting of uh, Colombian AGF, access has been included in the agenda um, of the national forums, including different uh, approaches, uh, not only access to infrastructure, but also uh, to different topics of interest, like, like access to information, internet for poverty reduction, access for inclusion and development, and this year, it was focused on infrastructure. And um, we uh, um, aim all stakeholders from private sector, government, academia, civil society, youth groups, and technical community uh, to discuss and to uh, contribute uh, meaningfully to facilitate the discussions about um, uh, these issues in, in our country. And, um, uh, during the last IGF, um, it was uh, presented all the um, policies and projects that the government is um, implementing to reach uh, most of the municipalities using uh, fiber optic and broadband access. However, uh, when we go to rural areas in Colombia, very close to these um, uh, municipalities, there is not access at all, or there are a lot of people that are underconnected. Uh, sometimes we have access, but uh, very limited and not uh, uh, useful for um, training online, for instance, or for video, or for uh, the full benefits of the internet. So despite these advances presented in, in our meetings, uh, some questions were, uh, um, uh, responded as well. So what is missing so people can uh, start using internet in a more productive way? How to create a proper environment so operators can deploy their, their networks? How to make people take more ownership of the internet? How to, uh, how, how to do to reach distant communities? and if it's Colombia ready or not to face the challenges of infrastructure. And uh, the discussions came out um, um, stating that there are high levels of inequality of use and access to the internet that are related to low levels of education and income. 
and many reasons why many Colombians do not have internet co uh, connections, uh, connectivity is uh, related to high costs, the belief that is useless, uh, the lack uh, of coverage in rural areas, and or do not know how to use it at all. So to face these challenges of infrastructure, there are aspects of inequality uh, must be taken into account. Um, at the global level, uh, uh, we uh, believe there is a great challenge in connecting the following uh, one billion users. So there is uh, a need to solve and overcome many barriers uh, such the one we discussed. And uh, we uh, acknowledge that government initiatives are positive, but uh, there is also a concern regarding how to keep them sustainable in the long term. There are a lot of uh, proposals of free uh, access to internet, uh, but then there is not a, um, um, a strategy that how we will keep this running. So sometimes governments came with uh, good uh, proposals, but then they don't last uh, uh, and uh, we have to start all over again. I will stop. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn to Georgia, and we will just keep going down the line. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ucha Setori from Georgian IGF. Uh, I want to continue uh, uh, talk about uh, problems related with excess, and this was hard topic last three IGFs, national IGFs, also in my country. Uh, first of all, it's related to this uh, population uh, from rural areas uh, and um, lack of infrastructure, lack of interest, I mean the commercial interest, lack of competition there is creating these barriers uh, for internet. And I want to split these initiatives, how we can deal with these issues in my country to uh, Direction. First of all, initiatives uh, with government, with civil society, and it's created and started was started on uh, IGF platform because in our executive committee all these guys are in the same level, and it's a good chance to discuss and to launch these issues inside of national uh, IGF platform. And uh, two initiatives. Uh, one of them is related with the infrastructure development. Um, so-called open net uh, project to create a real good the backbone fiber optic infrastructure in um, unserved areas and uh, cover uh, villages uh, less than 2,000 householders. A another one is related to awareness rising and uh, government with support of World Bank is going to give vouchers for uh, experienced uh, and training end users. It's not too much, it's uh, more than uh, 50 US dollar per household, but for beginning, for installation, for internet, I think it's enough for beginning and, and also it's supported with uh, trainings uh, from governments with involvement of local stakeholders, I mean civil society, small and medium enterprise association, some other stakeholders also, and part of this process in IG space. And the last one I want to share with you is related to the uh, ISOC project, which was, uh, which was uh, done just a few months ago, I mean, uh, to Shetty project. And uh, from ISOC, this is uh, shown like a case study for community networks. Uh, uh, this owner of this network is a local society member. They understand the importance of this. Uh, uh, and the price is quite low. Uh, for excess up to five megabit per second, it's more than a little bit more than ten U.S. dollar per month, and uh, uh, capital expenses uh, was given from ISOC, and but operational costs have to be covered by themselves by the society. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Well, Marilyn speaking, I'm hearing all, some interesting ideas already that I think we can capture and put into our the lessons that we can learn uh, from each other. And now I'd like to turn to Afghanistan. Thank you, Marilyn, again. Uh, my name is Aziz Takwa, and I'm representing uh, IGF Afghanistan. 
Uh, the access problems that we currently have in Afghanistan is uh, mainly being a landlocked country and being one of the under, uh, underdeveloped or developing country. So these two factors are really restricting access uh, to Afghanistan automatically. What happens currently is that we, as being a landlocked country, we uh, basically buy internet from our neighboring countries, be it Pakistan mainly. Uh, so we are connected through fiber with Pakistan. And we have a fiber ring that has run across the country, uh, which is connecting the major cities, really. And then all those uh, smaller cities uh, uh, are connected to the fiber ring uh, through the major cities. 5% um, of the overall population, which is 30 million, is connected. So that makes it 1.5 million of users being really connected online and to 28.5 uh, uh, million of users being unconnected and uh, literacy rates uh, being 25 percent uh, that makes it 7.5 million of people being able to read and write but that only means that they're able to read and write in the local languages but not in english and uh, that makes it uh, uh, 22.5 uh, million of the population uh, not being able to read and write at all uh, English or even the local languages. So those two are really restricting access automatically, where e even if we had internet connectivity, uh, you know, if, even if we were able to give them access and, uh, you know, connect them, but uh, do, uh, connect them for what? Because uh, they cannot even use the internet because of the literacy, uh, literacy rates, because... Um, if I was to categorize uh, the unconnected and the connected users in Afghanistan, I'll put them uh, in a different uh, kind of context. Uh, we have users uh, out of the um, 1.5 million who are connected. Uh, they're really connected uh, to uh, use Facebook and to use Viber. They don't use internet for research purposes and they don't use it for e-services. They don't use it for health services or they don't use it for collaboration. So it's mainly Facebook browsing and Viber browsing. So that gives it a different context in Afghanistan. Um, we have average users, you know, normal people who can read and write in, in English and uh, they, they have access to internet and they do collaboration. They, um, you know, they do educational research process and they use it for research and development purposes and these kind of, you know, categories of people. And, okay. and uh, then uh, the other problem uh, to access or connectivity would be the lack of local contents. Uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, that we have 1.5 million who are connected, and then we have 28.5 million who are unconnected. Uh, so, the 1.5 million who are connected, and uh, if they were to go online and uh, search for, um, you know, um, and do a research on a specific topic, they won't be able to find local contents, and it's going to be mainly in English. So, that, uh, you know, creates another, you know, access kind of a problem. They have access. You know, they, they do some sort of a research in order to build their knowledge and capacity. But then again, they're not able to find, you know, local contents and their own uh, local language that they can read and write in. E-services, there are not much of e-services really going on. So if we were to connect those people and provide them the e-services, uh, you know, e-business and e-government kind of, uh, you know, or e-commerce kind of transactions, that, uh, uh, you know, that is another major problem. So going to the second part, which is the government policy part, uh, Internet Society Afghanistan, we are working closely with the government in order to, uh, to build capacity of the local citizens. So what kind of projects can we actually work on you know, and collaboratively between the Internet Society and the government in order to build capacity and train uh, just normal usage of computers and no normal usage of, of uh, Internet. Uh, Internet Society Afghanistan is, uh, you know, is uh, working on that cl closely with the Ministry of Communications and IT. And access is one of the top priorities for Internet Society Afghanistan currently. Thank you. Marilyn speaking. Um, uh, when I was in Afghanistan, uh, Omar had uh, organized a kids' academy. And um, I am... Uh, uh, my idea at the moment is that we need to have the kids train the elders. 
because boy was I impressed by the kids ages six through 12 that I uh, held the Kids Academy with. So that may be my nomination for, um, for one of our uh, take takeaways uh, because it is such a challenge when the user is looking at this device and the only way you know how to use it is if you can read. Um, thank you so much for those comments and let me go to LAC IGF. Thank you, Marilyn. Kevin Swift here for LAC IGF. I think, uh, first of all, it's important to really understand uh, a bit more about the LAC region. It is a very diverse one. Um, it's one which has one of the highest concentrations of small island developing states, the SIDS, which are primarily in the Caribbean. It's one with uh, countries with large populations, such as Brazil and Mexico. Uh, both of which have more than 100 million people. So this level of diversity, it shows that the, the question of access um, is um, very heterogeneous across the region. If we were to look at some of the high level indicators, uh, as it currently stands, um, it's roughly 56% of our population that uh, use the internet. Uh, but one of the things is that um, even within that figure, we could see um, there are cases uh, of extremes. So for instance, Aruba, which is a small Caribbean island, has more than 93% of its population that uses the internet. Whereas we also have the case of Haiti, um, which um, comes down to about 12% of their population using the internet. So it's a lot of extremes and polar extremes that you find in the Latin American and Caribbean space. So at LAC IGF, uh, we have had the, the ability, the opportunity to really um, disaggregate all of these um, indicators and get to some um, key uh, issues and some key uh, details about what the nature of our connectivity and access issues are. And among those, um, one of the things that we have been discussing at LAC IGF, we have gone past the question of just basic connectivity and we speak about meaningful access. And by meaningful access, we are referring to um, the availability of skills and capacities uh, uh, to really be able to leverage uh, what the internet has to offer in terms of social experiences and in terms of economic opportunities. And we see that uh, some of the typical uh, barriers that still exist um, include a lack of local content in local languages. So for instance, 7% of all articles on Wikipedia uh, are in Spanish versus 30% in English. And it's important to note that we have a large Spanish speaking uh, uh, component uh, to Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we see that there's also the exclusion of indigenous communities. Um, there's still the questions of affordability and beyond just affordability uh, of internet access, um, questions of speed and quality are also um, very problematic. Uh, the internet experience as you go uh, from country to country within Latin America is quite um, diverse, quite distinct. Um, within there as well, um, there is the issue of about digital literacy and general awareness about the internet. And of course, if there isn't relevant local content, people don't really have a driving force to use the internet in a productive way. And um, in general, um, what we had discussed at LAC IGF is that um, from the policy standpoint, um, policy and legislative frameworks seem to be inadequate uh, to really uh, fully address um, questions of connecting the unconnected and really being able to create a competitive uh, environment uh, where we'll be able to have more digital innovation and a lot more economic opportunities via the internet. So that legal framework, policy framework is somewhat inadequate. And um, one of the benefits that I would say that has come from the series of LAC IGFs is that we are really getting governments um, to understand um, the importance of multi-stakeholder approaches to really uh, uh, get information from these um, marginalized groups that we are attempting to, to reach out to. So 
you get voices coming from the youth, you get voices coming from indigenous peoples, and it's truly approach that governments now understand um, how to create more effective uh, regulation to meet and address access questions. Thank you. One of the um, comments that you made particularly struck me as interesting, Marilyn speaking as the MC, and that is the um, extreme diversity of size of the countries and also the um, one thing you didn't mention, which I will mention um, because I'm very aware of it as you are, and that is that um, many of the islands in the Caribbean are um, harshly buffeted by um, the uh, weather situation that they experience, as we all know from um, what's, what happened to Puerto Rico and to the damage done to many of the other islands. And that is a reoccurring thing for them, where their infrastructure, um, their, the islands are beautiful and people want to live there, uh, but their infrastructure, their home, but also all other infrastructure, including air transportation, et cetera, can be um, just blown away. I guess that would be the right word, right? Um, and one thing that people don't understand uh, what that means in terms of the impact on life and health is that without the kind of infrastructure and the kind of communications that is needed, it is people die because first responders cannot be dispatched to the right places. And it's a reoccurring problem. So when we talk about using the internet or communications for health, um, I think we also need to think about how it is such an essential facility to be able to respond in time of emergency, and in these cases, very massive emergency. Um, I, I'm going to ask, um, uh, everyone gets one minute on this question. Um, and I want you to be direct about it. So of the following issues or topics, how do you see the impact on the interest of the citizens or the interest of the government to move forward more aggressively? How is culture or fear So do you, do you see a problem, a barrier for certain segments of society, women for instance, do you see fear of being harassed online or do you see cultural barriers? Do you see those kinds of concerns about being in, a, um, in an online world? Do you see that as a barrier? Because if we're going to take steps to make the internet more available, then we have to also understand what the human nature side or the social side of the barriers are. So we've identified literacy, literacy, pure literacy. We've identified digital skills, right? We've identified access. We know about affordability. What is the implication of the social and cultural? And so I'll give you a personal example. I'm 70 years old. I grew up in Missouri without a telephone, without running water, without an inside toilet. My parents would not allow the television in our home because they were extremely religious. Fundamental Protestants. The barrier to me for not having access to news, to information, even to entertainment. So that's an, an old example. But do, are there social and cultural barriers that would prevent people in your country from taking the step themselves if we're able to solve these other problems? And I'm going to start with Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm Maheshwara from Sri Lanka back again. Uh, yes, we do have that cultural bar barrier and also digital divide. And uh, there are some other safety issues because of this access. And uh, people are, um, uh, especially the parents, are worrying about their children uh, as it goes on. If they use the internet uh, 
too much so will it be a barrier, barrier for their life and uh, there's a cultural issue people think that uh, they don't want to change internet changes all the cult cultures normally cultures flow but uh, people want to uh, not to change as uh, in a cultural society like sri lanka so uh, these are the barriers that uh, affect these kind of thing and indigenous people we have in sri lanka there are about uh, seven groups of vedas in different locations, still they follow their traditional ways. So they do not use internet, they do not use uh, other things, but at the moment they are using smartphones. <laughs> some of them use, uh, yes, ah. some, some of them run uh, community uh, radios, and they use uh, internet as a tool, but uh, some of the, le even the leaders fear of these can be a challenge for their community. So these are the barriers, the, some of the barriers, and safety, safer issue is a big, a big in our country. That means safer uh, internet for the children, and especially for the women. There are a lot of harassments. Uh, last time, for the last uh, three months, there was around 4,000 inquiries for the uh, certs that came regarding the problems on social media. So that means it's a, in a high high class, and there's, uh, there are some other safety issues uh, such as internet addiction, which is not being still addressed properly. A lot of people, even myself, been <laughs> considered as a internet addicted, <laughs> always connected to the internet. Yeah. So uh, this is a matter that we have to think of when, even though we are talking about access, access makes some problems, and we have to create solutions for those things. Thank you. I'm going to ask us to speed this up one minute, Columbia. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. My name is uh, Julian Casas Buenas uh, from Colombian IGF. Uh, well, I think that uh, there are uh, many barriers, but uh, I think that we can also uh, change a bit, like uh, looking the other side. What's the solutions that we propose as Colombian IGF? And one of those is, uh, for instance, the recognition of community networks. But also, it's very important to know and understand the needs of the community. It's not uh, a matter, in, in, at least in our experience, that um, uh, reach uh, or, or bring some projects of connectivity, but also get involved the people in these projects so they can also contribute and they can also be part of the solution. Uh, we believe this is very important. And um, it, this can happen as well if we use open and uh, free software and hardware, uh, free hardware as well. So the deployment of these uh, new technologies are uh, uh, possible uh, for community networks. And also, it was recognized that uh, governments, uh, and the government in our case, uh, must create a favorable environment for inversion in infrastructure uh, for the private sector, uh, recognize that too strict regulation generates more abstinence, mistrust, uh, or discourage these investments. And also, it is needed to improve internet uh, coverage, promote trust, uh, develop uh, digital litera lit literacy projects, social inclusion with a specific programs such as uh, Cinema for All uh, for blind people and call centers uh, for the deaf among other um, uh, projects that we are um, uh, uh, promoting in Colombia. It was discussed also that IPv6, uh, uh, it's um, a limitation, only 1% of uh, ISPs are using um, uh, IPv6 uh, in the country, and um, it's needed more collaboration among uh, service providers so we can tend to reduce the cost of access in our country, which is still very high. Thank you. Thank you, but you have 20 seconds to answer my question. <laughs> are there cultural barriers or religious barriers that would hold people back. You mentioned you mentioned trust, but are there other kinds of barriers? And the reason I want to look at that is, 
I, and I agree with your answer that we need to customize the solutions to the needs of the people, but I'd like to get a better sense of, is it digital literacy? Yes, we've identified that. But are there also social or cultural barriers? Fear of the internet, for instance. There are places in the world where technology and the internet are viewed as being Western and therefore opposed just because of that concern. There are places where it is viewed as uh, not as changing the culture. And you can just give me a simple, yes, there are, no, I don't really see that. Well, uh, I mentioned already that uh, uh, most people think that uh, internet is useless for them because they don't know what uh, they can do. But uh, we believe that it's important that they uh, get the information and realize what could be how this technology can change their life for good. Got it. Both sides. Georgia, fear, anxiety, trepidation, cultural barriers, quickly. Okay. Um, just I told Georgia, Jeff, um, uh, no social and some religion barriers. Uh, and by the way, uh, I would highlight Georgians, 70% uh, of Georgia population are part of social network, Facebook. Um, but uh, I have to highlight uh, problems with the trust, with the safety, and with literacy. Mm. Um, and right now we are trying to finish our code of conduct to help to our end users, to promote them, uh, to better understand how it works, what they have to do, how they have to do, how to deal with these problems and challenges here. And also another uh, issue is uh, high mountain areas. It's impossible to uh, reach these areas because population is quite low. So, uh, that's my question about, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to skip Afghanistan and come back to them. I'm going to go to LAC IGF and then come back to Afghanistan. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. Um, there's, uh, um, I think that mic is on still. Yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank um, there, there may be a lot of um, social cultural barriers within the region, but one that I would particularly like to mention that I excluded um, when I was speaking before is that one of the greatest uh, communities that are affected um, within Latin America and the, and the Caribbean are, are women. And um, we're not just talking about women having access to technology. We're really looking at the question of um, fairness and equity when it comes to participation of the social experiences and um, the digital economy. Um, so for instance, uh, one of the things that, um, that had been discussed, and I think here at this IGF, um, there have been a lot of sessions addressing the question about gender and um, women's rights um, and the internet. Um, but again, within Latin America, uh, we have been discussing things like um, content that are content that is produced with anti-feminist narratives. So you have content and applications that are produced, and for instance, um, they may be targeting women's weight or say that um, they have to get rid of their baby way to look a particular way. And I think these are some of the things that really um, do intimidate um, um, other women from being able to equally um, participate and enjoy um, the internet um, as we want them to. Let me just give a little comfort to the audience. I know I'm skipping around, but I'm not leaving anyone out. I'm gonna go to Afghanistan, and then I will come back down here to West Africa, and then we're going to go to the audience. So, yes, please, Afghanistan. Thank you, Marilyn. Aziz Sakwa from uh, Internet uh, Governance Forum, IGF Afghanistan. Um, if I was to answer the question precisely within the one minute, I'll simply touch on cultural, social, and security issues. Cultural issues are there. Uh, since women are not really allowed to be online for their own safety purposes, and um, since internet is really, uh, over the past few years, we, we've all not noticed that internet is being used uh, to publish and post uh, you know, contents that are really considered to be radical 
or to be really considered to be sensitive. So due to cultural boundaries in Afghanistan, the head of family or the parents do not allow women especially to uh, go online and to connect. So if we were uh, to go back to the figure that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier on, 50% of our population, 50% of the 30 million, which is 15 million, uh, are women in Afghanistan. So that goes back into restriction of access again. Um, we have 1.5 million who are connected and 50% uh, of the 1.5, if they were to be women, we have 750,000 women who are connected and 3.7 million uh, out of the 7.5 million uh, who are literate, uh, 3.75 million of them uh, consists of women. So if we were to take a look at the figure and balance it out, we, we can clearly figure out that access, access is a huge problem and cultural, and bo uh, cultural boundaries and social problems uh, in terms of uh, women, women not being able to go online due to, due to the cultural and, and boundaries uh, you know, provided by their uh, head of families. And, um, because uh, Facebook is used uh, you know, also by extremists uh, very recently in Afghanistan, you know, that creates a huge amount of security problem. And uh, you never know who you're, contact, uh, who you're contacted uh, through Facebook. So those kind of restrictions are there and that has a very negative impact on the amount of uh, you know, access that we have in Afghanistan. So uh, the final words w would be yes, you know, problems are there, cultural, social and security. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from West Africa. And after we hear from West Africa, we're going to uh, the audience. And I want you to think about your questions. And if you, we're not, not all panelists are going to respond to each question. So also think about whether there's a particular um, NRI you want to respond. Please, West Africa. Uh, thank you very much. I think for us in West Africa, we have, um, uh, it's Salyu Mansere again. Um, uh, for us in West Africa, we have a um, huge number of problems. Religious is one. Uh, as you're all aware, we have the, the Boko Haram um, uh, situation, and it's not just Boko Haram. You have also extremists uh, who think that uh, the Internet, and in fact even books, as Boko Haram uh, are saying, uh, is bad. So there are those um, uh, those issues, but also in terms of technology, technology has got to adapt to some cultures. Um, being the last speaker, I'll just give you a semblance. Sometimes you think it's just the men, but also the women are also need to be uh, enlightened because we had a situation where a farmer had two phones, left one phone with the wife and went with the other phone to the farm. They're always able to communicate, but then late in the evening, the battery dies out uh, for the husband, and when he comes back home, he finds a very groupy wife, took the phone from the husband, threw it away, and they asked her why. She said, because after a certain time, I don't hear from him, all I get is some lady on the phone saying, the customer you want is no longer available. And in our community, when you say, when, you call, when a young lady calls someone a customer, yes. it's of another... So you need to adapt. <laughs> so you sometimes need to adapt technology uh, and how it's presented. So it's, it's, it's in, a, in a broader sense, it's the same thing with the internet. We have to look at the various cultures, respect those cultures, and adapt the technology, etc., so that no one calls someone a customer. But they changed that and started calling them the subscriber, no longer the customer. <laughs> But it, it, it's, very, it's very serious, it's very serious. We also have the issue of political pressures yes. because now people who want to stay in power will keep a certain segment of the community away from the internet because they don't want them exposed to what's, what's going on there. So we have that is those issues in West Africa and uh, hopefully they're changing. It's Marilyn speaking. I'm really glad you mentioned, you raised this issue. First of all, I loved your example. <laughs> um, and I also, might just uh, elaborate it um, to say that um, 
not just the technology needs to adapt, yeah. but the attitude of the providers yes. need yes. to adapt yes. to have this kind of customization yes. and sensitivity. Not, not customization, another yes. word, not Local. customer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just as I'm not being called the mistress of ceremonies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but I want, I'm glad you raised this issue about the, um, uh, the politics of the situation. Um, because, uh, and I probably, as a still holding a U.S. passport, need to apologize to the world for the creation of the term fake news. Um, I, I, um, I, I moderated a session on misinformation, disinformation, and fake news, an NRI session. And I do think this issue of the spread of misinformation or um, uh, po politicians attacking each other, or I let me say political parties attacking the opponents, is something that is also um, uh, a becoming a problem in the internet where someone in power or authority may decide, as you said, to limit access to content and information. Um, and I think that is a, a real sensitive issue as well. Um, some of the shutdowns are happening because of the political campaigns that are going on. Let's go to the audience and we're going to spend um, 10 minutes and then we're going to try to summarize as a group what our solutions or messages are. So keep your questions short and tell me if you want a particular NRI to answer. Of Mr. Omar, I'm Hadi Bufarhat. Uh, I'm a part of. Uh, we are a part of uh, the Information Lebanon Internet Governance Forum. Hadi Bufarhat, I'm part of the Information Lebanese Internet Governance Forum, and I'm a board member and uh, networks director as well of. Uh, Ogero, which is uh, the incumbent and the Lebanese main operator. Uh, so m my short question is about the, uh, the presentation of uh, the, uh, Afghanistan of Mr. Omar. When he said uh, that the megabyte is costs $150, so I think uh, mm -hmm. I was astonished and I was going to ask him whether it was for for every single megabyte or whether it was only for 3G and wireless data. Because at this price, whatever other measures you take, it's very hard to get more people to use the internet. So I just wanted to ask about this and wh whether the government fixes the price or not. Well, um, thank you so much for the question. Uh, it's the, the speed of the internet. The uh, data is gonna be unlimited. Uh, oh. with 150 it's the mbps okay. if you're getting uh, uh, one so mbps so of one a, a, a speed that's uh one unlimited yeah one still 150 yeah but still expensive in japan it's uh less than a dollar um, less than 50 cents for uh, um, that kind of a connection in the u.s uh, the figures are like a couple of years old but in the U.S., I was doing a comparison. It's um, $5. In Canada, it's $6. Uh, we are way too expensive uh, in Afghanistan. In Lebanon, it's no, it's $10. Yeah. yeah. One megabits per second only. It's $10. Mm. So we, we are $150. Mm. And that's not redundant. Redundant means that you have, like, a backup. When there is a fiber cut, for example, you will have another access. If you're getting a redundant connection, that's going to be uh, $300 in Afghanistan. Thank you. This is per month here. So, one more question? Please. Uh, good morning. I'm Lillian from Colombia. Uh, thanks for, for all the, the ideas. It was nice to hear you. Uh, I'm agree about that the technology and also the operators uh, should be flexible. But I also think that the governments should be 
very flexible in the in the regulations that we have because many times uh, our governments who don't allow that we innovate in solutions for 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 increment the access then how do you think we could um, invite to the governments to be more flexible, especially in things, for example, spectrum management and, and share, share community networks and share infrastructure and that kind of things. Do I have a taker on, so what, what's one of the solutions from the speakers? Or Mary, did you want to respond? No, mine is question. Let me add your question, and then we will respond to both. Mary Duma, again from Nigeria, and the coordinator of um, West Africa IGF. Um, I want to add to what she had just said. What should we do as, as coordinators of uh, regions and national IGF to influence or recommend or even persuade our governments who have control over spectrum, right of way, they do, uh, they do, they have control or they, they, they implement the human rights and all these added together, what can we do at our level, what type of recommendation should we send to them to be able to see that they will be able to come up with policies that would enable access more policies that will enable us, policies that will eliminate the barriers, and policies that would also, for instance, if, if they could give us, they could open up a spectrum and say this spectrum is not for, for, business, for commercial, it could just be for social, so that will. And then in education, so those are things that would uh, help us, because we have talked about illiteracy, digital, so, at our own level, what type of solution, what type of recommendation should we give to our government? Thank you. Uh, Julian Casas Buenas from uh, Colombia and IGF. I fully uh, endorse what you just said, Mary. I think that um, uh, in the case of Colombia, for instance, uh, we have, or our government has signed uh, the Latin American Digital Agenda. And for instance, they said there, that uh, we should promote uh, community networks. Uh, the ITU is also recommending the use of a spectrum for deployment of community networks. And when we came to the governments and tell them, okay, there are already in place a lot of recommendations from international organizations that are part of uh, our, gov uh, that our, our governments are uh, taking part of them. At the local level, when we, um, go and uh, try to implement the solutions, there are still uh, a lot of barriers, and these uh, um, international recommendations are uh, in some way uh, not taken into account by our governments. I think that we must have uh, uh, NRIs to insist in uh, the accomplishment of uh, these compromises from our governments. I'm I, I'm going to give a couple of the other panelists a chance to respond. Do it quickly because then we're going to sum up and we're going to capture some of this. So when we do the taking stock session, we will be able to actually put some of these recommendations out in the record and then talk about follow-up. So you're, you want to make a comment? At, okay, and then we'll come to Georgia and then, okay, okay, but make it quick. Hi, thanks Marilyn, and thank you to Mary and Lillian uh, for the question. Um, I'm going to just piggyback, piggyback a bit on what Julian said, and I'm stepping away from the issue areas, but just looking at the process and the approach. Um, at LAC IGF, we have been working for a number of years to become closer with a regional digital development process called the ELAC process, mm -hmm. as conducted by the UN ECLAC um, based in Santiago. And with that process, um, on the one hand, um, it's not just enough to be able to shape decisions. And I think a lot of us, we achieve um, that uh, level of shaping um, the, the plans or, sha or, or policies that governments have. 
Um, but what we would like to see eventually is that as part of the entire build out uh, for or the approach to digital development that um, non-state actors also included as part of the implementation mechanisms. And it's one of the questions that we have been working on for a number of years. I would say very honestly at that today there isn't a concrete solution to that, um, but non-state actors, um, especially from the LAC-IGF component, have been uh, trying um, uh, distinct ways of ensuring that we become part of the implementation of what would be um, the next cycle of the regional digital development um, agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. 30 seconds. Just going to the issue of what we can do regionally, um, uh, in West Africa, there's a big push for the community base. I think just talking about what, uh, in terms of spectrum, we want, even on the license, ECOWAS is now looking at having different tiers of license, that you'd have the community-based license, which is almost non-profit. And then that's uh, one uh, key area that uh, definitely we're looking at uh, in West Africa, making it a community-based non-profit. Someone will take uh, several villages, provide connectivity, but just to recoup the costs. Yes. Maheshwara from Sri Lanka. Uh, I feel, uh, uh, my uh, other question regarding the same question, uh, is government the only stakeholder to answer these questions? No, there are other stakeholders. So we have to, uh, in the Sri Lankan IGF, we have other uh, participants of the stakeholders, and most of the stakeholders are active at the moment, working uh, solutions collaboratively. So the problems are finances and implementation barriers, human resource kind of things are still there. So we need the support from the community where that we can uh, implement these solutions. And uh, there are ISOC Sri Lanka chapter and uh, other various organizations are uh, collaboratively working on some solutions, especially the safe internet and uh, disability co uh, disabled community. So, my answer. Thanks, Marlene. Uh, which I said for Georgia IGF, uh, two points from Georgia. Uh, uh, we're also always pushing government or guys, like my players of uh, internal governance, because they are policy makers in some initiatives. For example, OGP initiative, Georgia is quite active in this uh, process. And also IGF, you really have to be in TPDC for the next year. It's a good opportunity for us to explain and involve as much government uh, employees inside of this process, how it's working, how, why it's so important. And the last point about amendments in our constitution, it was done just two months ago, about access, open access to the internet is implemented like a human uh, right for Georgian citizens. It's also like a positive uh, liability of uh, our government and policymakers. We have three minutes left, and we need to sum up. I see one more request for the floor. It, is it from the same company? No, no, it's, it's related to the uh, Arab uh, IGF. Actually, I'm Zainab Harb. I'm from the Lebanese IGF, but I'm here uh, to, uh, talking about the Arab IGF, uh, in which uh, I was participating for the update of the roadmap. Uh, the roadmap uh, of the Arab IGF uh, was uh, drafted last uh, last week. It was final uh, last week and will be posted for uh, public consultation. The main the main priority set was the access, uh, uh, f uh, the meaningful access that uh, uh, lead to inclusion. Uh, so I think uh, that this is the main issue in our region, as only 41% of the Arab people are uh, connected uh, to the Internet. Thank you. Thank you, Zina. And, and your region, uh, Marilyn speaking as the MC, and your region has some of the same uh, significant diversities. So when you talk about your region, when you look country by country, you may find a country in your region, in the Arab region, that has very high connectivity, such as UAE, where ICANN just met, or even Saudi Arabia, 
compared to the other countries which are much, much poorer and uh, have very different geography. Um, I, I have a couple of ideas about some of the key messages that we might think about sending forward. So here's my first big idea for you. My first big idea is that this group seriously looks at collaborating about how to develop a significant session in each of your next NRIs that is targeted to addressing these challenges with concrete suggestions and that we think about identifying international experts or speakers that can be used consistently for you. We think about the fact that, um, let me tell you something about ministers. Most of them do not have technology advisors. Let me tell you something else about ministers. Most of them are subject to losing their jobs when the political uh, regime changes. So you have to make friends at a number of levels. And you guys know that, but it's very, very difficult to do. Access is very difficult. In one of the uh, sessions I moderated, one of the uh, uh, participants noted that he had seen the head of the, his TRA twice at um, IGF meetings and had not yet been able to get an appointment in his country. Use your IGF more creatively. Invite different ministers and create a session that is not where they don't feel like they are just going to hear from civil society and business about the problems, but a session where you're going to present some of the ideas. Here's how community networks, here's how white spaces, here's how introducing competition, here's how building community centers, here's how digital literacy programs, and, here, and work together, and we can use the NRI network to find some examples of success stories that can be reapplied to e create the excitement and the energy on the part of your minister that they are going to be able to lead ministers, ministers, minister of health, minister of education, not just the minister of communication. Key to you achieving anything is a relationship with the minister of finance. Even when your minister of communications wants to do something, or the head of your TRA wants to do something creative with the funds from your universal service fund, he's still got the budget guy. And budget guys are like the world over. They all have a red pen. So what we have to do is convince the budget guy that by increasing the number of users, you increase the revenue, you increase the business opportunity, you increase, increase the taxes that are paid by the new businesses. Convince people that by solving some of these problems that we're going to have to solve by working together, developing local solutions and local entrepreneur online applications that are customized. Now, I'm not saying any of this is going to be easy, but think about creating the idea that you will create a meaningful event, not just a high-level speaking opportunity, and then let's think about something else. Let's think about trying that and then putting together a proposal for a follow-up workshop from the, this group of NRIs and others for 2018. Because the other thing that I have found very useful to motivate government leaders is to remind them they have an opportunity to come on an international platform and take credit for the change that they're affecting in their country. So I saw some other consistencies and I think Anya and I will work together, but I think we've got to think about how we address these issues of digital literacy, but we can't address that unless we can motivate our ministers of education and our departments of education to come up with ideas for how to address basic literacy and that has got to address adults as well. So let me say one other thing. My father had a sixth grade education. He became an award-winning farmer by all of the education he got by radio.
won award after award after award for the best performance in, mil in milk production and in produce development and never read a manual. Radio, so what's my message there? Sometimes the application has to be customized by being voice or by being video. And bandwidth is a major problem. But if I can't type to you, I can still communicate to you. So I want us to think really creatively about also our calls to some of these software providers and these application providers and do not think that the answer is six big US-based corporations. Because building the businesses in PESA is known worldwide as a success. So I have really enjoyed learning from all of you. I think we are only at the beginning of this journey. And I really hope that all of you will think about, could I do something really creative at my IGF? So you have motivated the IGF USA to focus on bringing in our indigenous tribes to work on the access issues that we have, because we still have a lot of them too, and I will do my best, can't promise, because we're bottom up. Everybody else gets to tell me what we do. Um, but I will do my best to bring the IGF USA with our indigenous issues into this working issue as well, because we have the same problems there. I know we have to go. There's another meeting going on. Anya and I will work on trying to gather this. I want each of you as the speakers to think about your five key points in summary and send them to me and to Anya. And if any of you have an essential point that you want to make sure we get in the report and you weren't able to speak it, would you send it to us as well? Thank all of you for coming. And thank you for your investment in creating something, we did not talk about electricity, but I'm going to mention it just before we go. I think we need not only a connected world, but a turned on world, and we need electricity for that. Only five minutes over, goodness. You guys put so much work into this. It was thrill. No, I, I was. I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled. But you have to think about the. Um, I the I Triple E has a project called Advancing Solutions, and I think we should think about um, how we can connect with the I Triple E. They have 500,000 engineers and scientists as members. And many of them live in your parts of the world. They're not all in Western Europe. I know, I'm on your stage. I need to leave.